My name is Eve Kleinerman. I am from Cabrini Green Legal Aid. Uh, I have been with Cabrini Green Legal Aid for about two and a half years and I work in our criminal records department. Cabrini Green Legal Aid offers legal services um, free of charge from in four areas of the law, criminal records, criminal defense, family law, and housing law. So if any of those things, um, you know, pique your interest and that might be something that you're looking for. Um, the contact information is on some of the paperwork that I passed out. Um, through our help desk and everything else, and I can also answer some individual questions towards the end. Um, this presentation today is going to be about overcoming barriers because of your criminal record. What opportunities are available to you um, if you have a criminal record? What opportunities are available to individuals who are looking for employment with a criminal record? Um, and what are ways in which a criminal record could be cleared under the law in the state of Illinois? So. Um, just as a disclaimer, everything I'm talking about today applies to the state of Illinois. So if there are criminal records or areas of employment that you're looking for outside of Illinois, those are more specific questions that probably wouldn't be answered by what I'm talking about today. I can try to answer them if you have those questions. Um, but in general, this will only apply to, um, to the state of Illinois. So the most important thing um, for an individual with a criminal record is to know what's on that record and to know what your rights are once you have that record. Um, there are a couple of uh, myths that go along with criminal records knowledge that I just want to sort of dispel for you and give you the truth about them. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm going through basically the outline that you guys have in front of you. This is so that if you forget everything I say, you can always go back and it'll jog your memory. Um, but I'm obviously going to add extra stuff too. If you want to take notes, that's fine. If it applies to you, if not, you know, you need not do that. So all arrests our public record in the state of Illinois. So any employer or anybody in the public who takes the time to do a search can do a criminal record search on an individual for any um, criminal record, any arrest record, um, even if that case does not result in a conviction. So conviction, the fact that the case did not result in a conviction does not mean that it's disappeared. Employers can still see it. Um, if you're applying for housing, perhaps they can still see it. If you're applying for schooling, perhaps they can still see it. Somebody has to go about um, taking that time and effort to get that record, but once they've received it, it is public record. Um, and criminal records don't ever go away unless you've filed to expunge or seal your cases. So it doesn't automatically fall off your background after any number of years, whether it's seven years or 10 years, it doesn't matter. It's not an automatic thing in the state of Illinois. So even if an employment application asks you, have you ever been arrested or convicted in the last 10 years or the last seven years, that doesn't mean they can't see the rest of it. That means they just might not care about the rest of it, right? So you still have to be aware that they might know about a conviction from 1995, even if they're not asking about it on the application. When they run your background, that might come up for them if, um, if that's something that they're looking for. Um, additionally, um, and this may apply to some of you guys in the room, that prior to 2010, some, an individual is considered to be an adult at the age of 17. So even if you were convicted at the age of 17, you were still convicted as an adult or arrested as an adult. And so that would show up on your adult record. Juvenile records are a whole different ballgame. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But for adult records, that would start from looking at most of you guys in the room, that would have started when you were 17 years old. So even if that felt like you were a juvenile, Legally speaking, you were really charged as an adult. Um, and so employers are not, back, going back to what I said earlier, um, employers aren't prohibited from going back any number of years to look at convictions. So even if they ask for any convictions in the last seven years, when they run their background check, unless they specify to the background check company that they only want convictions in the last seven years, they're going to get the full picture. So they have the right to say, we only want the stuff in the last seven years. And some employers do that. But many employers go all the way back throughout your lifetime, and then those things are going to come up. But the most important thing to know is that just because you have a criminal record, or you know someone with a criminal record, or whoever does have a criminal record in your life, that doesn't mean that there aren't rights that that person has. An individual with a criminal record has rights not only under Illinois law, but also under federal law. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's important to know. Just because you have a criminal record does not take you into any different realm where you don't have rights and responsibilities in regards to employment, housing, etc. So the best way to know what you're dealing with in terms of your criminal record 
is to get a copy of that record. And the way we um, recommend doing that is in one of two ways. If you have been arrested in the, by the Chicago Police Department ever in your life and you're looking for your records only in Cook County, then you'd want to get a copy of your Chicago Police Department rap sheet. That will include arrests in the surrounding suburban districts as long as it's in Cook County. Okay? If you've had arrests outside of Cook County, then instead you'd want to get what's called an Illinois State Police um, report. That would include any arrests or convictions within the state of Illinois, not just within Cook County. But those are a little bit um, harder to get, harder to read, harder to figure everything out. So it's best if you've only ever been arrested in Cook County and you have been arrested by the Chicago Police Department to get your Chicago Police Department rap sheet. And where to get that is at 3510 South Michigan. It is going to cost $16. So that's for the Chicago rap sheet. There is no way to get that fee waived, unfortunately. But after you've got that $16, rap sheets don't expire. So as long as you don't have a new arrest in your life, it's good. Even 10 years from now, that'll still be valid as long as you haven't been rearrested. So that's where you'd get your Chicago rap sheet. And you can get fingerprinted for that um, from 8 to noon, Monday through Friday. Um, and then you have to pick up the rap sheet a couple days, sometimes a week later. They'll tell you when to do the pickup. And then you come back during, I believe they have extended hours for the pickup. I think it lasts till like 3 p.m. to do the pickup. Um, for an Illinois State Police report, if that's um, more what you need because you have out-of-county stuff, you'd be able to get that um, by calling. There's a number on the uh, handout that you have for the Illinois State Police um, Expungement and Sealing Division, and they'll be able to give you the whatever the mo closest police department is that can fingerprint you and send off for your records. And the cost for that is usually, I think, about $35. It varies and it has changed over the years. So it's a little bit more expensive. Again, it's harder to read. So if your arrests are only in Chicago, only in Cook County, get the Chicago rap sheet. Much better um, bang for your buck in terms of what you're getting out of it. Now, the last option in terms of how you could get your criminal record would be to go to the physical courthouses and get copies of your certified dispositions. This is the least reliable way to do it because what the clerks do is they do a search based on your name. But so let's say my name's Eve Kleinerman. That's pretty unique. I don't think there's any other Eve Kleinermans in the state of Illinois. I could be wrong, but maybe they are or aren't. So if I were arrested and I was looking for my records, it's going to come up as Eve Kleinerman, and they'll probably be me. But what if my name was John Smith? It's going to be really hard to figure out which John Smiths were me and which ones were someone else, and it's just doing a search based on your name. That's the only way the clerks can do a search. So unless you know every one of your cases, it's going to be hard to figure out to make sure you got the full accurate picture just by going to the courthouse. Okay? Um, that being said also, if the police mistakenly ever misspelled your name, which happens pretty much for everyone, it's not going to be there because you're not going to know how they misspelled it. Right? So the best way to do it is to get one of the rap sheets, as I said, either the Chicago Police Department rap sheet or the Illinois State Police report. And once you've got that rap sheet, that's how you know what's on your record. But this is where we get a little confusing because Chicago rap sheets are inaccurate probably more than 50% of the time. What they get right are when you were arrested and the fact that you were arrested on that date, right? They can tell you you were arrested on October 29th, 2014. Past that, they don't ever follow up with getting the correct information from the court. So maybe your rap sheet's going to tell you that you have convictions that you don't think you have. Don't freak out. Because that's OK. That doesn't mean that the courts think you have convictions. And nobody else can get your rap sheet except for you, because you're the only one that has your fingerprints. So correct background checks are going to come, come from the um, court records. And those are generally correct, although there are incidents where the court records are incorrect as well. But the rap sheets are something only you can get. And what we use them for in researching your criminal background is we use them to know how many times you've been arrested, which they're accurate on and the dates you were arrested so that we can find that. And those tend to be accurate. Um, past that, all the rest of the information, whether it says you were charged with a felony but really it was a misdemeanor, whether it says it was a conviction but really it was a dismissal, don't stress out about that. Again, nobody else is seeing your rap sheet except for you unless you show it to them. And my best advice for you is don't ever show your rap sheet to an employer or a potential employer. If they want to run a background check on you, they can feel free to do so. But that will come through an official source through the court records. That will not come from your rap sheet. And if you're showing them your rap sheet, you might be giving them more information than they have a right to legally. OK? 
Okay? So if an employer asks you to see for a criminal background to provide documentation, don't ever give them the rap sheet. What they might want is for you to go to the courthouse and get a copy of your disposition, and that's fine because that's giving them the accurate information. But your rap sheet gives them entirely too much information that they don't legally have a right to unless they get it through a background check that they have ordered, okay? All right, so that's, that's background information on background checks and how to figure out your record. But once you've got your record, what do you do with it? So there are two um, forms of relief in Illinois called expungement and sealing. You may have heard about them. It may be a little confusing as to who can expunge, who can seal, what does it mean, what can I do? So the bottom line is if you're expunging, you're expunging, and if you're sealing, you're sealing. But one individual cannot do both, okay? So either you're eligible to expunge or you're eligible to seal. And what's the difference? The difference is, or how do you decide what you can do? If you have ever been convicted of anything in your adult life, so for most of you all in the room, since your 17th birthday, if you've ever been convicted of anything, including a major traffic offense, then you're no longer eligible to expunge. Okay, expungement is only for people who have not been convicted of anything in their life. And that applies whether your conviction happened in Indiana, Wisconsin, Ohio, or Illinois. We have to know about all of that, and the court will know about all of it. So in order to get your record expunged, you can have no convictions ever. But that's where we fall into the ceiling category. So um, what are the differences between the two? Expungement, which is really just of the dismissed cases, or in some cases in Illinois where you got a special type of sentence that wasn't a conviction, which some of you might know about, depending. We'll talk about that. Um, it would destroy the records. Nobody would have access to those records after the date of your expungement. Um, not employers, not housing, not law enforcement, not the courts, not anyone. Okay? Sealing, on the other hand, after your record has been sealed, the courts and law enforcement still have access to those records. So let's say you get your record sealed because you've had a conviction, and then you get rearrested. The court knows that you've had those previous 10 cases. So you can't walk into court and pretend that you've got a clean slate because the judge knows, the state's attorney knows, um, the police knew when they picked you up, whatever the case may be, but it's not hidden to them. But it is hidden to employers. So that is a step in the right direction, especially because mo the biggest thing that people struggle with with criminal records is getting employment. So the one exception to the employer part is if you have been convicted of a felony and you had that felony sealed, there are certain employers who can still have access to that sealed felony and only very specific certain employers. And those are the ones who are authorized by law to take your fingerprints for a background check. So the most common examples of that are jobs in healthcare, jobs in the school system, any state or government, any federal jobs, um, any jobs for the Chicago Transit Authority, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, jobs for financial institutions, okay? But if you get a felony record sealed, a conviction sealed, and you apply for a job at McDonald's, they cannot see your sealed felony, okay? They're not taking your fingerprints. If you do not get fingerprinted for a job, they're not seeing your sealed felony, okay? But your rights don't change. Even if you've sealed that felony, when they ask you a question on your job application, have you ever been convicted? The answer is no. Okay? Even if you're applying <clears throat> excuse me, for health care, even if you're applying for schools, even if you're applying for government jobs, it's been sealed, which means your right is to say that you have not been convicted, as long as you don't have other convictions that weren't sealed. But they'll still see them, and you may still have to work through some of those issues with the employer, but those employers know. It's specific employers that have the right to take your fingerprints. They know the, what's going on, that it's sealed, that it's this, that it's that, et cetera. Okay? Um, so... There are, so in order to uh, qualify for expungement, you can only have ever had your cases dismissed or if you ever received a sentence of supervision, supervisions that are completed satisfactorily are not convictions, okay? If you've ever received a sentence of task probation, that is not considered to be a conviction, or 710-1410 probation, which is first time drug offender probation. And if you've ever received those three types of sentences, and that's all you've got in terms of your sentences. Those aren't convictions, so you might still be eligible to expunge your record. Now, if you've gotten a sentence of any of the other things I'm about to name, that would be a conviction, and then you'd be in the category of sealing. So that would be jail time, probation, conditional discharge, um, obviously prison time. Any time that maybe you got a sentence that was time considered served, right? You got picked up, you sat in the lockup for two days, you went to court, the judge said, if you just plead guilty today, you go home. 
So it gives you the sentence of those two days that you were already in the lockup. That's a conviction. Even though you never did a sentence in the future, the last, because you got credit for those two days, that's still considered to be a conviction. Okay? Um, so then once you're in the sealing category, unfortunately not everything can be sealed. Right? So we have almost 1,200 felony charges that could be brought against someone in the state of Illinois, but only nine of them can be sealed. So there are very few felonies that can be sealed. On the other hand, almost all misdemeanors can be sealed. Okay? So the exceptions about which misdemeanors cannot be sealed is that the law stands right now are any misdemeanor convictions for violent crimes, sexual crimes, driving under the influence, or reckless driving. Now, the law is changing in January. So anybody who has a conviction for a misdemeanor violent crime, as long as it's not domestic battery, you're in luck. Because the law is changing, which will allow sealing of assaults, batteries, aggravated assaults, and reckless conducts starting in January of 2015. Okay, so that's a great change in the law. So, but currently the way the law stands, convictions for battery, assault, aggravated assault, reckless conduct, domestic battery, criminal sexual abuse would not be sealable, as well as convictions for soliciting, soliciting a prostitute, patron, patronizing a prostitute, public indecency, obscenity, or pimping, or driving under the influence or reckless driving. Those are the misdemeanors that can't be sealed. If you have convictions for any other type of misdemeanor, you're in luck, those could be sealed, okay? Now when we get to the felonies, instead of naming the ones that can't be sealed, I'm going to name the ones that can be sealed. Now for felonies, as you may or may not know, there are um, five classes of felonies, the most serious being in class X, and then it goes one, two, three, four, four being the least serious. The only felony convictions, and I'm talking about convictions here by the way, not just charges. If you, something was brought against you, but it was dismissed, doesn't count as a conviction, can be sealed no matter what. Um, there are no exceptions to that. But for felony convictions, it must be either a class three or a class four felony. There are no X's, ones, or twos that can be sealed at this time. All right? So of the class three or four felonies, it must be a charge of prostitution, possession of cannabis, possession of a controlled substance, possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver, theft, retail theft, deceptive practices, forgery, or possession of burglary tools. Okay? And if it's anything other than those nine, it's not a sealable felony conviction, okay? Now, even if you are eligible to seal or expunge, there are still waiting periods. So, the way the expungement process works. For expungement, the waiting periods are, if it's a dismissed case, it can be expunged immediately. Unless it was stricken off with leave to reinstate, you have to wait 160 days, which is about five months. So that's not a terribly long time, right? For any of the types of non-conviction sentences I named earlier, those supervisions, the TAF probation, and the 710-1410 probation, for those sentences you have to wait, for, two, for supervision you have to wait two years in order to expunge from the end of your supervision, and for the two types of probation you have to wait five years from the end of your supervision, okay? For sealing, the rule is you have to wait four years from the end of your last sentence, and that applies to all convictions. So if you were convicted in 2001 of misdemeanor theft, and then you were convicted in 2014 of misdemeanor damage to property, right? you have to wait four years from the end of your sentence in 2014 even to seal that 2000 case for theft. Because you're viewed as one whole person, so all of your convictions fall into the same waiting period. Whatever waiting period you're in applies to everything on your record unless it's a dismissal. So you got to wait that four years, and then after that, the process is that you have to prepare a petition, file that petition in the district in which your case occurred. So um, that would apply, obviously, in Cook County, there's six districts, but if you're talking about other counties, you'd have to go out to those counties and file your paperwork there. You may have to go in front of a judge and have a court date. And then once you go in front of the judge and the judge grants it, your expungement or your sealing can be granted that day, and it's effective that day but it usually takes about 60 days for the Illinois State Police to update their records. So it's possible that your background check won't be accurate for about two to three months after your sealing or your expungement is granted. Okay? Um, after you have had your record sealed, if all of your convictions were sealed, you can honestly answer no to the question, have you ever been convicted? Okay? If you're left with a, something else along the way, you know, one felony that can't be sealed, 
one misdemeanor that can't be sealed, et cetera, you still have to answer yes. But if we're talking you cleared your whole record by sealing, you can now answer no to that question. Okay. All right, so um, just, to, just to review, so expungement and sealing, they both get filed in Cook County um, in the district in which they occurred. So if you were arrested in Skokie, you have to file your petition out the Skokie Courthouse. If you're arrested in Chicago, you do it at the Chicago Courthouse, et cetera. Um, there are filing fees in the clerk's office as of today. As of today, the filing fees are $135 for the petition plus $9 for each case. But if you're currently, you guys are all students, if you're not working um, while being in school, if you are working but your employment, um, your income is below a certain level, you might be eligible to get your fees waived for that. So don't let the fees deter you because um, we're going to talk about our help desk where we handle all of this. We'll let you know. We'll help you fill out the paperwork to get your fees waived. And it's very likely, very possible, that you wouldn't have to pay those fees. Yes, sir? Does disability count as income? Yeah. It does count as income, um, but you'd have to be, there's a pretty, um, you'd have to be getting a lot of disability to get placed out of having your fees waived. So most likely it would still be okay. Unless you're getting disability and also have some huge amount of money somewhere else sitting around, most likely you'd be fine. Okay. So um, that would be something that would have to be talked about you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, getting your fees waived is a real option, and so don't let those filing fees deter you from going through this process. The way I look at it, the only thing that absolutely cannot be waived in this process is that $16 to get your rap sheet. Okay. Now, when we go back to that rap sheet conversation, in order to file to expunge or seal, you have to have a copy of your rap sheet if you've ever been arrested by the Chicago Police Department. So when I say it's helpful for you to have it to know it's on your record, that's true. But it's also required for you to have it in order to do an expungement or a sealing. Okay? So it's helpful if you get it, and it's required, so you may as well get it up front if you think you might be doing an expungement or a sealing any time in the future. Okay? Um, <clears throat> So I just named a lot of things that can be sealed, but then you might be sitting here thinking, what about the thing that's on my background that isn't what I just named, right? So now you're not an expungement, and I just told you that your record can't be sealed. What do you do? So there are a bunch of options, and it's just a matter of knowing what option is best for you, what option is available to you, and how to complete that. So the most extraordinary remedy out there, the biggest deal out there, would be to get a pardon of your conviction. That's asking the governor of the state of Illinois to pardon your conviction. Now, again, if your conviction is from out of Illinois or federal, that's a whole different ballgame. We're talking about convictions in the state of Illinois. You can ask the governor, whoever that governor might be after next week, who knows. Um, if you've got a criminal record, fingers crossed for Quinn, so just putting that out there. Um, so if you, have a criminal, if you have that record that can't be sealed, you can ask the governor to pardon that conviction. And this is where I'm going to take back what I said at the very beginning, where you can either do expungement or sealing. But if you get a pardon for your conviction, you can expunge that case. Okay? So not seal, expunge. So that's the one exception to you can either expunge or seal, because if you get a pardon conviction, you can expunge that case, but you have to seal the rest of your stuff. So it's a little bit of a mix, but it's, it's such an extraordinary remedy that it, it's not a big deal. So, yes? What are the chances of getting the um, Currently, um, Governor Quinn, this is why I say we'd want Quinn to win, um, has been pretty good, and he grants about 40% of the petitions that he gets in front of him. Okay? But part of it is knowing um, how to put together that petition and when to do it. Okay? So what we recommend at CGLA which is not a requirement. This is not the law. The law is you can apply for a pardon at any time if you don't have an open case. Okay? You can apply the day you get out of prison. You can apply the day you get off probation. But the question is, is it going to get granted if you do it that way? And our experience at CGLA is that we recommend waiting at least five years from your last contact with the criminal justice system. So that means five years from the end of your last sentence, five years from your last arrest, etc. And that's at the very least to make sure that what they can see is that you've had this period of time or you've been rehabilitated, you've been living in society without getting rearrested. Okay? So 
Again, that's just a recommendation. It's not the law. But you want to make sure you um, give yourself the best shot possible if you're looking for this form of relief. Doing it too early doesn't really benefit you because if all you're going to do is find out that you got denied, you'd rather wait a little bit longer to then apply and do it better so that you could get granted. Okay? Um, so petitions for clemency go in front of the Prisoner Review Board. The Prisoner Review Board uh, consists of you know, the hearing that you'd have would be in front of any number of members. It could be three members. It could be, I've seen them up to like six members sitting on a panel who read your petition and then they ask you questions relating to your life, your convictions, and what good you've been doing in the community and why you need this form of relief. Why do you need a pardon? Has it stopped you from getting employment? Has it stopped you from getting housing? Um, are you trying to set a good example for your kids? Things like that. And then that board, the Prisoner Review Board, makes a recommendation to the governor, and it's confidential. You never know what the recommendation was. But they make a recommendation to the governor that goes along with your petition, and that petition goes in front of the governor's desk. Okay? Now, the waiting time for a petition for clemency, that's the pardon, is very long. Okay? Right now, an individual who files for a petition um, for executive clemency could wait anywhere from three to five years to hear a response. Okay? But at the end of that three to five years, if the answer is yes, you get to expunge that record, and that is huge. That can change your whole world. All right? Now, the reason that waiting period is so long is because um, there's a huge backlog of petitions on the governor's desk. There are a lot of individuals in the state of Illinois who are looking for pardons, and the backlog is just so long that he's about four years behind. Okay? It's unfortunate. Um, we're hoping that things will maybe speed up as we go forward in the future. He has been playing catch up. So each year, it's been getting farther and farther ahead, but we can't guarantee anything. So you have to plan. That's going to be the long haul. We're not talking, you know, you go to court and you get your record sealed within six months. We're talking, a, you know, a number of years. Now that is the most extraordinary remedy. But what if you can't wait five years to get a job? Because most people can't, and that's reality, right? There are other forms of relief that might be available to you. Um, I know that one of the um, common options here at COIN would be to go into a uh, field of health care. Okay? If you're looking for a job in unlicensed health care, so I mean if you're applying for a job as a medical assistant, in medical coding and billing, um, as a CNA, as a home health aide, things like that. I'm not talking about licensed health care like as an RN or an LPN. Um, or as a doctor, but as an unlicensed practitioner in healthcare, and even that actually applies even if you're applying to be a janitor in a hospital, um, a maintenance person in a nursing home, whatever the case may be, if it's in a healthcare facility and it's not licensed, if you have certain types of convictions, not all convictions, but certain types, you can get what's called a healthcare waiver. Without that waiver, the employer is unable to hire you. It's not that they don't want to hire you, it's that under law they can't hire you. But if you get this waiver, they can hire you. Doesn't mean they want to hire you, but they could. So if you've made an awesome impression on someone and they really want to hire you, they say the only reason they can't hire you is because of your criminal record, all you have to do is get a health care waiver. You don't have to give up on your passion, you don't have to not apply to those types of jobs, you just got to get this waiver in between. And how long that takes can be under three months. The Department of Public Health is a little slow, so sometimes they get granted in two weeks and sometimes they get granted in six months, but it could be, it could be that two-week period. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bank on that, but it's a much quicker process and it's not a hugely um, intense process. You have to give the Department of Public Health information regarding your conviction, about your life going on right now, and why you need this, okay? And then once you've given that information in a formal petition, then they will um, either grant or deny your waiver. So when an employer gets an individual who um, has applied and has a conviction that might make them ineligible for working in healthcare, they run a background check and then they do a search in a system and it shows up with green flags or red flags. Um, if you get a waiver, it shows up with a green flag but with a waiver attached. So some employers um, we're trying to fix this because the employers shouldn't do this, but some employers say we don't accept anybody with a waiver, right? So you can't necessarily overcome that. They really shouldn't be doing that. That's um, discrimination, but um, trying to overcome that is very difficult, although we are. 
there are many employers out there who will accept individuals who have health care waivers. Okay? It's out there, it's possible, and it's one way to overcome and to get into that field. Now, if you have a conviction and you feel like you might not be able to get into health care if that's the field that you're looking towards, don't necessarily assume that your conviction is disqualifying for you. Okay? There are a lot of convictions out there that don't disqualify someone from working in healthcare, and that's where you need to get a copy of your record, potentially come down to our help desk, ask that question, and we can talk to you and figure out what you need. Okay. Um, then the next option, what if you're not looking to work in healthcare, but you still want to overcome the barrier that your criminal record causes for you? So there's something called a certificate of good conduct and then certificates of relief from disability. So certificates of relief from disability are a certificate, well actually both of these types of certificates, are certificates that come from a judge, and it's proof of rehabilitation. So a judge, the same type of judge that might have convicted you in the first place, is gonna sign an order that says they believe that you, John Doe, have been rehabilitated, and that they believe that your conviction from 1995 um, should not be a barrier to your employment in a certain area. Okay? So let's talk about the relief from disability part first. So what if you're looking for a job in, um, you want to get your real estate license, okay? You want to get your license as a massage therapist. You want to get your cosmetology license, your barber's license. Um, any number of licenses in the state of Illinois, in fact most licenses, um, can't be obtained if you have certain types of convictions. Okay. Each licensing board is slightly different. They have different ones, whether it's a drug conviction, whether it's a crime of violence, whether it's, who knows, theft, um, et cetera. Different types of licensing require different things depending on what they feel like, right? If you're applying for your real estate license, they don't really want you to have a theft conviction because you're going into people's homes without them present, and if you have a propensity for stealing things, that's why they don't want to give you your license because they're afraid you're going to steal from your clients. Now, that being said, what if that happened a long time ago and that's not what's going on in your life right now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't get your real estate license. What it means is you have to go in front of a judge and get a certificate of relief from disabilities, which allows you, specifically in that order, it says you are permitted to get your real estate license even though you have the following convictions, whatever's on your record, okay? And then you take that to the licensing board, and you'll have a, usually if you've been denied, you have a hearing, you take that to your hearing and you show them, and you've got the certificate, they still don't have to give you your license, but they can, okay? So if you've got everything else going on in order for your life, you could get those, that license. So that is if you're looking for a specific type of license. What if you're just looking for a specific type of job, not a license? Let's say you wanna get a job in the Chicago Public Schools. Even if it's as a maintenance worker, as a, um, somebody working in the cafeteria, as a secretary, as a who knows what. You don't have to be a teacher, it doesn't have to be um, you know, that type of job. It can be any job. Or what if you want to volunteer in your child's school? Maybe it's not a job. Sometimes it's just volunteering, but they run a background check on you these days. Um, it seems like everywhere runs background checks on everyone. So you want to go volunteer in your kid's school, but they say you've got a background. What you need is a certificate of good conduct. <coughs> the certificate of good conduct allows you to work or volunteer in the Chicago public schools, or similarly for the Chicago Transit Authority, for the Metropolitan Transit Authority, um, for the Chicago Park District. I think those are the only specific employers that have restrictions on who can work for them. And a certificate of good conduct can overcome that barrier. So again, maybe they don't want to hire you and that's up to you to make a good impression on them with a good resume and awesome interviews and everything else. But once you've gotten the rest of yourself in order to get that job, the certificate will help you overcome your criminal record. Now certificates of good conduct can also be used generally. So let's say you're applying for a job, just, um, I don't know, any old job, right? You're applying for a job in a place that's not restricted from hiring you, but they look at your criminal record and they say, I don't want to hire you. You've got a criminal history. I've got 10 other applicants who've never been arrested and I'll hire them instead, right? So a certificate of good conduct can be a letter, it's a, you know, it's a certificate from the judge, but it can, serve as a proof of rehabilitation to the employer saying put this person in the same light as you would somebody who doesn't have a criminal record, right? They still see the record, it doesn't take it off the paper, off the background check, but they 
have the opportunity to, um, to know that a judge has decided that you've been rehabilitated since that time. Now, the biggest part of the certificates of good conduct is that, so let's say someone has been convicted of assault, right? And they go apply for a job, and the job sees that they've been convicted of assault, and they think, but you're just an awesome employee, uh, you know, potential employee, I'm hiring you. And then on the job, somebody, that individual gets into a fight with somebody on the job. So then the person who gets injured in that fight maybe sues the company and says, you should never have hired John Doe because he, you knew he had a criminal record, you knew he had a propensity for violence, and you should never have hired him, right? But if that person, if John Doe with the assault conviction had a certificate of good conduct, it would make that employer immune from that lawsuit, okay? So it takes away their risk and hiring somebody with a criminal record. And that is huge for employers. When an employer doesn't hire someone because of their criminal record, it's because they're afraid of what happens. They're not afraid that you won't do the work. They're afraid they're going to get sued down the line. But this takes away that possibility. And so it gives an employer an opportunity to hire you and to know that they're safe from getting sued, but you still have that record on, your, on the table, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a huge form of relief out there right now. And what we're trying to do is to educate employers educate um, you know, human resources department so they know what those are. And it's especially important that if you have one of these, if you get one of these, to try to you know, be upfront about it with the employer in the interview and give them that knowledge that this is what it's allowing you to do and this is the benefit of it. Because sometimes the employers just don't know. Okay? Now, there are certain um, there's, there's one extra form of relief that is a certificate for, of eligibility for sealing. This is something that goes in front of the Prisoner Review Board again. It's sort of like a mini clemency petition, but excuse me, it is available for individuals who have one not sealable class three or four felony conviction that is nonviolent and not relating to guns. Okay, so those tend to be like public benefits fraud, misuse of a credit card, um, things like that. But the individual cannot have ever been convicted of anything else in their life. So if you've only ever been convicted once and it was a class three or four nonviolent, not having to do with guns case, and also non-sexual, then you may be eligible to get a certificate of eligibility for stealing. And what that would mean is that you um, would go and get in front of the Prisoner Review Board just like you would for a pardon. But instead of getting a pardon, it's a much quicker process and you could in theory hear back within six months to a year. And that process would mean that they would give you a certificate that allows you to go in front of the court just like the, everyone else who's sealing their records that might be eligible and get that record sealed so the employers couldn't see it. It's not like a pardon, it doesn't expunge your record. It just allows you to seal your record, which could be potentially huge for you if what you're looking for is a job in an area that doesn't take your fingerprints. Because again, if it's a sealed felony, the fingerprinting employers are going to still see that, right? So it's not an answer for everyone. And there are very limited opportunities when this is a possibility. So just keep that in mind so it's not going to apply to everyone. In fact, it's going to apply to next to no one for this. But if it does apply to you, awesome. So if anything, that I've talked about so far, you think applies to you or to somebody you know or to somebody you work with, etc. The second um, handout you got is a flyer that says CGLA's expungement help desk. On the front side of that is our information for our help desk in the Daily Center downtown, and the back side of that is for our help desk out in Markham. We have two help desks um, Monday through Thursday at the Daily Center and only on Wednesdays in Markham. And if you have a copy of your Chicago Police Department rap sheet, we will happily help you. We will prepare whatever petitions you're eligible to do. We will give you advice about what you're eligible to do on all those other forms of relief, the certificates, the health care papers, the pardons, the certificates of eligibility for sealing, et cetera. We'll tell you what you can do. And potentially, if you're eligible, we'll make a referral for you into our office to get help with that type of relief. In my office, I personally, as well as my team of Lawyers that work with me, we do health care waiver applications, we do certificates of good conduct, certificates of relief from disability, certificates of eligibility for sealing, and most importantly, we do clemency petitions. So if you fall into our 
guidelines in terms of where you live and how much you earn or don't earn, as the case may be. Um, and your cases are eligible. We may be eligible, we may be able to help you with those forms of relief. But the first way to get involved with our office and to see what you can do will be to come to one of those help desks with a copy of your Chicago rap sheet. Now, if you want like a quick summary of all the various law parts, that's the second page of like the basic expungement and sealing, breaking it all down for you again. But I already told you all that, so we don't have to go over it. Um, but that's just sort of a key thing if you are interested. Now, for both of our help desks, it's first come, first serve. So at the Daily Center, we start sign-in and we take 25 people per day. And our sign-in starts at 8.30 in the morning. So sometimes, give me one sec, sometimes by like 9, 9.30, we've already got 25 people there. So if you show up at 11.45 saying, hey, you're open till noon, probably not going to get help that day. So make sure you try to get there early. I'm not saying you have to be there at 8 a.m., but try to get there before 9, because that way, not only will you get seen that day, but you won't be sitting there all day. Because I'm, when I'm there, sometimes I'm there till one or two, still helping individuals. And that's because we've got 25 people and I'm gonna help every single person until we're done for the day. But you don't necessarily wanna be sitting there for four hours and I totally understand that. So the earlier you get there, the better. And out in Markham, um, the way it works is the first 10 people who show up at 10 a.m. get helped on the spot. And the second 10 people, so it's only 20, drop off their paperwork and have to come pick it up the following week. Okay, that's because we have fewer staff out there, so we can't do quite as much on the spot. The one thing I will say, in terms of the um, help desk, if you know that on your record you have been arrested more than 20 times, okay, then my advice to you, and I'm gonna give you, um, my advice to you would be to come to the help desk, but be aware that what you're gonna do is get an appointment to come back. Because we have limited capacity at our help desk, so we can't, sift through more than 20 arrests on the spot right there that day. So what we do is we take it back to our office, we prepare all your paperwork, and we usually call you and let you know what you can do, and then you have a date to come back. So if let's say you were at the help desk this morning, your date to come back would probably be around the end of November. You come on back to us, and by that point, we'd have all your paperwork ready for you, right? So just be prepared that it's not that you're gonna get necessarily, with more than 20 arrests, get service on the spot, okay? Yes, sir, you had a question. Uh, what city? So if you know, if you have the records, you know, the printout or you know what's on your record, we can give you advice about what you'd be able to do there, but we can't actually do the paperwork for you. Because we can only do paperwork for within Cook County. That's because that's the only court system we have access to at our help desk. So we can't get accurate information, nor do each county uses different papers, like different petitions, and so we can't we don't have those petitions. Um, my advice to you, this is not actually on the paperwork so you could write it down. If you have cases that are outside of Cook County but within the state of Illinois, the, pers the people you want to look into talking to, and they have a website with a phone number, is the Illinois State Appellate Defender. So that's the Illinois State Appellate Defender. And they can help guide you to the correct forms and the correct procedures for counties outside of Cook County but in the state of Illinois, okay? Um, those forms are available online, but I will be honest with you, they're different forms in each county, so my recommendation is to call, um, potentially even call the clerk in the county where you had that case so that you can ask them what they prefer. Some counties you can mail in your petition, some counties you have to be there present yourself to file them. Um, so it's something real specific for each county, and there are so many counties in Illinois, I just, we only specialize in Cook. So, okay. Um, so, then, the other thing is, we're talking about all these ways to clear your record, but what if you still have a record at the end of the day? You have, um, you have rights that go along with that, and there are things you should know so that you know how to protect yourself when you're with an employer, um, when you're applying for jobs, et cetera. So it is a civil rights violation for an employer to use arrests that didn't result in a conviction in an employment decision. So let's say you've only ever been arrested, you've never been convicted, but an employer gets your background and sees that you've been arrested 10 times but never convicted, and they don't hire you and they tell you, maybe they're stupid enough to tell you that the reason they're not hiring you is because of your criminal background. If they do that, that is a civil rights violation and ideally, you would get it in an email, you'd get it in a letter, you get something that's written so that you can bring that case against them. Now let's be honest, 
it's 2014, and applying for jobs is very difficult. Okay? The economy is terrible. There's a million applicants for every job. And most employers, as I say, aren't stupid enough to tell you that the reason you're not getting the job is because of your criminal record. So this is very hard to prove that they're committing this violation, but you need to know for yourself that that is a violation. Okay? Now, if you've only ever been, um, had arrests and not convictions, then get your butts down to the help desk and get your record expunged. Okay? Because that shouldn't even be coming up to employers, and if you get it expunged, it won't be. But if you haven't gotten it expunged yet, you should just know that that is your right. Additionally, similarly, employers cannot use expunged or sealed records against you in an employment decision. Now, that doesn't apply for the employers that take your fingerprints, right? But for employers that don't take your fingerprints, if they accidentally or incorrectly get copies, get wind of your sealed convictions on a background check, let's say a background check company, they are notorious for getting them wrong. They get old information, you've since had it sealed, whatnot. They can't use it against you in an employment decision, and you can bring them a copy of your sealing order, and they have to not consider that. Again, how do you prove that they're considering? It's tough. But if they say they're using your criminal record against you, and you know you've had all your records sealed, come back to them with your sealing order. Come back to them with a printout from the clerk's office that says you have no criminal record. You're allowed to do that. Okay. Um, then the biggest thing that most employers don't violate, but it's important for everybody to know, is an employment application cannot ask you whether you've ever been arrested. They can only ask you if you've ever been convicted. Okay. So if you've only ever been arrested and you misread that question and you're answering yes, you might have been able to answer no all these years. Right? The question has to say, have you ever been convicted? Most employers aren't dumb enough to put on their application a question that's illegal. They don't because that's printed and it's out to everyone. So instead, they ask if you've been convicted. But oftentimes people misread that question and think they're asking have you ever been arrested. And the answer is have you ever been convicted. So read the question carefully because if the question says have you ever been convicted, it might also ask if you've been convicted of a felony. Have you ever been convicted of a felony in the last seven years? Those are very specific questions. Do the math, calculate, figure out, know what you were convicted of so you're answering the question correctly. The law's changing. But as of right now, employers can ask that question at the first stage of employment applications. In January, that won't be the case. It's called ban the box. Employers will no longer be able to ask that at the first stage of the application process. But for right now, they can. And we've got another couple months till January. And if you're looking for a job between now and then, you just have to know what you're getting into. Yes, sir. Whatever the last day is that you got off of whatever sentence it was. Okay. And if it was prison time, then it would be the end of your parole time. Okay. okay. So then under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, if you get denied a job because of your criminal background, you are entitled to a copy of that background check. So if an employer ran a background check on you and says, your background came back and we're not hiring you because of your criminal background, you have the right to say to them that I would like a printout of that background. Why would you do that? Right At that point, you just throw up your arms and you're done. Except what happens if it was another John Smith with the same date of birth, but it's not you? There are ways to prove it because every time you're arrested, you get fingerprinted. And if that's not you, and it wasn't you with the same date of birth, then you can bring proof to them and say, that wasn't me. Sometimes the background check is accurate and you just have to overcome it in one of the other ways we're talking about. What if you have a common name and the background check that the employer gets comes back with 25 cases, but you've only ever been arrested five times? Maybe the employer wouldn't care about those five arrests, but they care about some other dude's arrests, right? That's not fair, and you have the right to get a copy of that background check and to bring them mitigating proof to show what is and isn't you, okay? So then we get into what can show up on a background check. For dismissed cases, they can only show up on a background check for seven years. So anything that was not a finding of guilty can only show up for seven years. So if you're worried about cases that happened that were dismissed back from the 80s, 90s, up till 2007, they're not showing up on your background checks for an employer. Okay? So you're freaking out because you get a printout of your Chicago rap sheet and it's got so many cases and 
this is what an employer is seeing. No, that's why I'm telling you, don't show your rap sheet to an employer. It's for you and you alone. Maybe you want to share it with us at the help desk, right? Don't show that to an employer because the employer only saw your dismissed cases from now back to 2007. But your rap sheet shows for all time. So you don't want to show them more than they have a right to because it's only going to make the situation worse. Okay? Um, now, we sort of talked about this a little bit already, but in terms of under Title VII, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, so they are they're stepping it up and they're trying to enforce that an employer can't have a blanket ban against hiring an individual with, criminal, with a criminal record. The employer can't say, just like you can't say I'm not, we don't hire women, we don't hire uh, people who are black, we don't hire people who are gay, they cannot say we don't hire people with a criminal record. That is the same type of violation under Title VII as if they made a, a, discrimination state, a discriminatory statement like that against any other um, protected class. So individuals with a criminal record are considered to be a protected class like that. So you can't have a blanket ban. It doesn't stop employers from doing that but not saying it. It's certainly not going to be in their employee manual or their hiring criteria because most employers just aren't going to do that. They might think it in their heads. But if, they ever, if you ever found a document from an employer that said, we don't hire people with criminal records or they tell you that, again, try to get it on paper because it's illegal. Um, also, when an employer is considering hiring, if they've gotten to the point of considering your application, I don't mean you just filled out an in, you know, a basic uh, employment application, but I mean like they've gotten to the point of considering you in a serious way, they bring you in for an interview, et cetera. They have to do a balancing test of that weighing that criminal record and the time it's been since the criminal record, weighing that with how that's going to affect the job that you're going to do for them. So if you're talking about a conviction from, you know, 1995 for domestic battery because you got in a fight with your significant other or your other family member and you're applying for a job as you know a cashier at Macy's I'd like them to try to tell me how a conviction from 1995 for domestic battery is going to affect your ability to effectively do your job as a cashier at Macy's personally I can find no connection that's what they're required to do, is to balance that and then find that connection. But they don't always do it that way, but this is what the law says they're supposed to do. Trying to pinpoint it to say they did it wrong is hard. But the law does give individuals with criminal records rights, and it's important to know them so that you understand what you're dealing with. Okay? Now, we talked about this a little bit about our help desk. In terms of, on the last page of this outline, it talks about other places you can get legal assistance. So we've got Cabrini Green Legal Aid. There's Illinois Legal Aid Online. Okay? It's a great resource. It's a website that has a lot of interactive portions of it that can walk you through different things, different steps with a lot of legal questions. And it applies um, served for the entire state of Illinois, so DeKalb County. It applies equally there. It applies to other counties, et cetera. So that's a great resource for you. The Chicago Legal Clinic um, is a legal aid that's not entirely cost-free. So whereas at CGLA, um, we do not uh, have any fees, except for we do have an intake fee if you become a client for one of those forms of relief. We're talking about not expungement or sealing at the help desk, but one of the in-house types of relief. We have a $20 fee, but that's, that's it, $20, and you're done. Chicago Legal Clinic does have a sliding scale fee um, schedule, so you'd have to call them and find out what your fees would be and what you'd be eligible to do. They offer similar, similar services than we have. Oh, and I didn't even realize we had this on there. The Office of the State Appellate Defender, the number's even on the back there for you, is for questions outside of Cook County. Okay? Yes? I have a question. Can an employer from, from Illinois look up your, your arrest record or your In theory, yes. Um, they can't. It depends the type of background check that they run on you. So if they run... Um, a background check. Employers can, when they get that background check and they're asking the company who's doing the background check, they can specify all these things. So they can specify they want a national search, they want only for the last 10 years, they want only convictions, etc. They can specify all that and it depends what they're running. Generally, yes, they would come up with cases, convictions, usually from out of state. Um, that all goes up, it all gets, you know, it's a feeder to the FBI background check and that all comes back down so, a, you know, a conviction from out of state would still come up on that. Second question is, um, in 
Wisconsin they have what's called a sea cap. Do y'all do that here? I don't know what that is. Well, what it is, you just like um, when they, they run your name or whatever, and um, they go by, it pulls up all your arrest, your arrest record or whatever. But it doesn't specify, but it, it does if you read it in, in Intel, it tells you like um, convictions or, or dismissals or whatever. And I had a problem where um, employers would just get it and just, you know, they wouldn't read it, you know, just because it existed, you know, mm -hmm. and this is qualified for the application process. Well, in Illinois, that shouldn't happen that it would just straight up disqualify you, as I said, but that could happen. Um, that's basically just like any other background check. It's not, so in Illinois, there are a couple options. Um, there are private background check companies, right? So there are background check, com check companies that are totally private. They pull, if, you've, if you're ever in the um, criminal courts, in the clerk's office, there are public access terminals where you can look up records. There are men and women who are standing there 8.30 to 4.30 every day and their job is to sit there and look people up and that's because somebody asked their company for a background check on someone. So that's what they're doing. Um, but then also employers can pay to get records, um, background checks from the Illinois State Police. And if they do that, that's a more encompassing background check. So it's not, so, it's not one standardized thing in Illinois, um, but it certainly can show as much or as little as the employer requested. Yes? What if you have an open case right now? Unfortunately, no. Um, expungement and sealing are only an option if you don't have a current case right now. So that includes if you're on a sentence right now, if you're doing probation or parole or um, conditional discharge, supervision, things like that. Um, but as soon as that's over, you can come to us and we'll be able to give you some advice. You'd still be potentially in that four-year waiting period because it's the end of your case. But we can give you the advice so you know what you're dealing with. Um, and unfortunately, in addition to not doing the help desk part with expungement or sealing, you also can't do those other kinds of relief, the health care waivers or the certificates, until your case is over. Okay? Um, but as soon as it is over, definitely come to us. Okay? So you said that uh, the Illinois um, State Police Force, so that have uh, the other county and then mm -hmm. would have the county included? Yes. Include? Yes. The way it works is Illinois State Police reports include all um, of Illinois. Um, as I said, though, if you've only ever been arrested in Cook County, it's best just to get the Chicago rap sheet. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? It will, unless you get a pardon from the governor. Um, potentially, you can get a health care waiver. Unfortunately, Class X felonies aren't eligible for certificates of good conduct or relief from disability. Um, but health care might be an option. Clemency is an option, getting a pardon from the governor.